If there's one thing in this cruel, dark, ugly world that makes me happy, it's gonna be vintage stuff. I love vintage stuff more than I love new stuff. I love the third generation Toyota Supras with the flippy headlights more than the modern Supras. I love old beige box computers more than I love my annoyingly heavy multicolored light pollution generator. Old stuff just makes me happy, and it must make you happy too, because that's why you're here. Or you found me recommended to you, you happen to be in one of the 14 Discord servers I send these to when they come out, or you just want to see my hands. And if you're here to see my hands, you'll get your fetish material in this video just like the rest, don't you worry. Come sit around the campfire again, my lovely audience, it is time for another story. A story about vintage keyboards, why I hate the US patent system, IBM, and catastrophic buckling springs. Make sure you have your pudding pops and McRib meals, because we're going back to 1981. IBM, previously known for making business machines and distributing them internationally, didn't dabble too much in the home computer market before the 1980s. Big Blue, feeling pressure from the current dominators in the home computer market like Tandy and Commodore, released the IBM 5150. The base model 5150 sports an Intel 8088 processor with a 4.77 MHz clock speed, 16 kilobytes of RAM, and a monochrome video adapter, all for the ridiculously low price of $1,565. It would come in a kit packed into a massive ass box, and it would be delivered to your door. The same kit that you just dropped nearly $1600 on came with the computer itself in that beautiful case, a CGA or MDA monitor depending on which video adapter you bought, and a keyboard. Computers at the time were expensive because having a personal computer in the house was a luxury and not everyone could afford it. This was a time where computers were tools because video games on home computers weren't exactly as prominent as they are today. The keyboard the unit came with was the fabled Model F, previously used on IBM's System 23 Data Master. The Data Master's Model F was integrated into the unit, whereas the 5150's Model F was standalone and could be plugged into and unplugged from the computer. Today, the Model F remains a staple of vintage keyboards, only to dwarf the fame of its more popular younger brother, the IBM Model M. The Model M is a bigger staple of vintage keyboards, but the Model M owes its life to the Model F's creation. F's tend to be on the more expensive side than M's, even if they aren't in the best condition. This one right here is going for $175, and it looks like it's been smoked around for the last 37 years. At least the fucking thing works. A lot of these are overpriced, partially because a lot of attention has been shown on these in the last few years, and yes, I'm aware I'm doing zero favors to fix that problem. I'll have a short buying guide on what I look for when it comes to Model F's and vintage boards as a whole near the end of the video, but for now, we're here to talk about the board itself. This... Fucking piss. Shit. Fucking Jesus, there we go. ...is my Model F. Mostly everything works on it, except for the spacebar, but we'll talk about that later. I have no idea when it was manufactured, nor do I have any info on its shop dates, because the mounting plate inside the board doesn't have that sticker, so I have zero idea as to when this was built. There was this number on the sticker stuck to the back of it though, and this is a part number. From what I've ascertained, this keyboard was built quite early in the lifespan of the Model F. I'm gonna be 100% honest and say that I don't know everything about IBM and the way that they name shit and however else and all this other stuff, I'm no expert, I'm no LGR, so this is confusing to me. So to prevent myself from being wrong and sounding like a complete asshole, I'm gonna keep it very simple. The keyboard I have uses IBM's XT 5-pin DIN cable connection standard, and this is confirmed by its part number sticker. Since modern machines don't often have XT or PS2 connectors on them anymore, I bought a source converter for IBM XT keyboards. Source converters use a closed source conversion firmware and are some of the best converters available for retro keyboards, as the firmware allows for remapping and macros. Sorer unfortunately disappeared off of the face of the earth according to Desthority, but their tech still remains. I bought the converter from eBay for less than $50, and I also use another converter of theirs meant for RJ45 Model M's, but that's a story for another video. This motherfucker is heavy. The bottom of the case is stamped sheet metal, and the other half of it is plastic. The guts of the Model F also include another large piece of sheet metal in the back for the layers of PCB and other stuff to sit on. This fucking meatball totals in at about 8.9 pounds, or roughly 4 kilograms. It's not the heaviest keyboard out there, of course, you know, Battleship Model Fs and Model Ms are considerably heavier than this, but this does make me take a pretty decent sharp inhale before I pick it up off the floor from my chair. 
Does anyone else store vintage keyboards under their desk? Only me? Okay. The weight doesn't make it cumbersome to use, but the size of it does. This is a very bulky keyboard, it takes up a good portion of my desk, and it's a right pain in the ass to type on because the layout is different from literally everything else I've ever used. Control is all the way up here where caps lock normally is, caps lock is where right side alt should be, the enter key is vertical and not horizontal, the larger key caps look like this, the shift keys are tiny, and the function row is on the left side. It's a mess, but... You gotta think that everything here was engineered and designed for a reason, and the keyboard being like this isn't mutually exclusive to this version of the Model F either. The IBM System 23 Data Master came with the Model F as well, and it looks exactly like mine does. I have no idea, but there was probably a very good reason behind all of these design choices, even if I do consider them to be hubris today. Even though this is a mechanical keyboard, it doesn't use typical MX clone switches like I've previously featured on this channel. In fact, it doesn't use MX clones, Alps clones, or any other derivatives. It only uses a spring that snaps under the push force of the keycap. According to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, they're known as Buckling Spring Torsional Snap Actuators, and they were filed to the USPTO by Richard H. Harris on behalf of IBM in 1971. Buckling Spring Torsional Actuator is a cool name, but it's still not as cool as the Model M with its, and I'm not making this up, catastrophically buckling compression column switch and actuator. The official classification according to the patent states, snap action arrangements depending upon deformation of elastic members using compression or extension of coil springs, one end of spring transmitting movement to the contact member when the other end is moved by the operating part. What the fuck? Yeah, don't worry, I have no idea what the fuck I just read either. In layperson terms, when a keycap is pressed down, the spring inside of this plastic barrel buckles under the weight of the key press. The spring is mounted to a rocker, which normally sits up inside of the board like this. When you push down, the spring buckles to the side, which then forces the rocker to hit the contacts below it. According to the patent, the idea behind this was to provide an improved snap-action rocker switch which utilizes only a single spring element and does not require mechanical interposes, pushers, or other separate rocking direction initiation or restoration structures. Basically, to keep it simple, our pal Richard wanted to simplify the process of a mechanical-based key switch, so we went on and did it. All the system needs is a keycap, a spring, a rocker, and something to house it in. I've heard from some people that the Model F, and the Model M for that matter as well, had their clicky switches designed to feel like a typewriter. I didn't grow up with a typewriter, and I never had to evolve from a typewriter to a computer keyboard like the folks had to do back then, but I do own a Smith Corona Coronet Electric 10, which according to its serial number was manufactured in 1961. I can confidently say that neither the Model F nor the Model M feel like the Smith Corona, but I could be wrong. I can't compare it to my IBM Wheelrider, yes, I also own a Wheelrider, because that first came out in 1984. It would probably mostly compare with the IBM Selectric series of typewriters which first hit the scene in 1961, but I don't own one of those, and judging by where the prices for Selectrics are going, I probably never will either. I can't substantiate the typewriter argument for the F and the M, but I can't refute it either, so it's just gonna sit there until a Selectric falls into my lap, and knowing my luck with scoring random shit for less than what it typically goes for on eBay, that might happen, you never know. The keycaps on the Model F are die sublimated and not double shot. Die sublimation is when heat transfer is used to apply a decal to a target object, or simply printing. Die sublimated keycaps are typically thinner than double shots because of their construction and their legends are printed on the caps instead of double shot molding which involves two separate pieces being smushed together. The key feels just like an average clicky switch. You're not typing on angel titties or anything, but you're also not typing on rattly MX blues, so it's a good middle-of-the-road experience for a clicky switch in my head. It's pretty good, and it's quite satisfying to listen to, even for long periods of time. I don't get annoyed by clicky switches, and if I had to pick one to hear for the rest of my life, the Model F is probably going to be what I want to suffer with. I originally was going to play a puzzle game called Paganitsu, which was developed by Keith Schuler and published by Apogee Software in 1991, but in my opinion, that game is kind of boring, and you probably don't want to watch me run around caves solving puzzles for a 2-3 to three minute sequence in a video. I honestly consider the Model F to be the king of vintage keyboards, so let me introduce the king of vintage keyboards to the king of video games. What's got six legs and no head? <laughs> you in 30 seconds. Hail to the king indeed. I haven't played Duke Nukem 3D in a while, and I figured it would be nice for me to revisit since the leak of all the 2001 DNF files. The keyboard performs well, but unfortunately for me, the spacebar is broken. 
The spacebar itself is supported by a wire like on other boards, but the wires on the Model F clips into the spacebar and one of the clips on my spacebar is broken. The spacebar slants to the left side when I try to strike the key, so I must be very deliberate with how I strike it. I have to hit it dead center to register a key press, which is a stupid pain in the ass when trying to play video games, not to mention the spacebar feels quite heavy by itself. This is heavy enough to rival unlewed vintage MX Blacks, which are known to be ridiculously heavy linears, but honestly, the heavy spacebar, I actually kinda like it, I'm not gonna lie. The keycaps also aren't doing me any favors. These things are fucking weird, and I hate typing on them because I always miss and hit the side. I am beyond fully aware that this isn't a gaming keyboard, but if you want to go on eBay and buy one of these, gaming might not be too far out of your radar for the shit you want to do with it. If we take the spacebar and those caps out of the equation, though, the board is perfectly fine. It feels good, and the clicks give me audible feedback as to when a switch actuates so I can sort of mentally organize myself and how I'm moving in the game. The normal keys are weighted almost perfectly for my taste, so I don't feel the need to exert too much force on the key to bottom it. It's a very satisfying keyboard to use, and it's decently serviceable when it comes to playing video games. I'm actually kind of surprised. Whether or not you watched the rest of the video or skipped up to here for this, it's time for everyone's favorite part, the best part, the sound test. God damn, our old pal Richard Harris was onto something, wasn't he? The Model F has that little spring ping whenever you type that I just cannot get enough of. I picked this up for $145 before shipping and it's in working condition. Even if the spacebar isn't totally functional, it still does work. It's not 100% perfect, but it's damn near close. Do you want a Model F? Do you want to own a piece of keyboard history? Awesome, I did too until I looked at how much these fucking things cost. I mean, Jesus Christ, look at this. What the hell is wrong with you charging this much for this shit? Naturally, your ideal scenario is to find one for $145 like I did, but I have ridiculous luck when it comes to eBay sometimes. Most of these go for about $175 and above. I bought mine in a high-risk, high-reward scenario because this board was untested. Untested boards, more often than not, typically go for lower than their tested counterparts. Untested boards come about from the seller not having a system to test them with, such as in my case, but there are many reasons why they can be untested as such. You also must be careful with buying an untested board, because the thing might not work. These things are old. Shit breaks. Hell, the plastic mounting plate in my Model N cracked in five places, so the board is virtually useless. If you're curious to see if an untested board works, I got some bad news. eBay sellers won't open the board up or make any attempt to try to get it working for you at your request, so if asked, all the sellers got for you is a shrug and a go fuck yourself. Cosmetic defects don't really affect these boards because I could actually use the Model F as a blunt weapon in case of a home invasion instead of a gun. These things are pretty resistant to getting knocked around unlike the Model M, but as I said earlier, shit happens. Thank you for watching per usual, thank you to Davey for making me sound nice and crisp, and thank you to some folks over at GeekHack who asked to remain anonymous for providing their knowledge on Model F part numbers. Without your help, research for this would have taken a lot longer. Next time you come around, I might be talking about a new eBay board or something for my personal collection. Depends on if the keyboard I bought comes in before then. As for me, I'll be around in the Keyboard Cave Discord. You should totally join in. There's not a whole lot happening, but that's alright. Swing on in and start a conversation. Someone will be there to welcome you. Probably me. I don't really have anything else better to do than the shitpost on the internet anyway. For this time, for the last time, and for next time, thank you for tuning in. I'll see your pretty faces around my campfire soon again.
Ed's dead, baby. Ed's dead. But I can still hear his damn keyboard.